Now, one thing I didn't explain is why I decided to put the blackberries in. Blackberries and blueberries are a great companion plant for each other. Now, I haven't done a video on companion planting yet because I don't feel that I'm really um, knowledgeable enough about it, but. All right, everyone, so today's the day. I got the book, I'm ready to learn, ready to rock and roll. Let's do this. Okay, here it is. From Next Level Gardening, Brian Lowe's book. I mentioned a couple videos ago that I was not prepared to do a video on this topic. I'm gonna to read this book, learn, 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 apply it, and then, and then I'm going to totally do videos on this because I've been companion planting since I started gardening. I just haven't really known what to do. I just mix stuff together, hoping it works. So, hey, more videos to come. I'm excited, everybody. Get out there and start gardening. If you're not, get seeds in the ground. It's time. Let's do it. All right, everybody. So as you just saw right there, I have been beyond excited to get this book. As soon as he mentioned that he was writing this book, I immediately pre-ordered it on Amazon. Because like, I, like that clip showed at the, the very first clip, I don't know a lot about companion planting. I know the basics, you know, plant this with that, that with this. Uh, but I don't, I didn't understand all the other stuff that comes with companion planting. Um, I hope oh, everyone enjoys this video. I've never done a book review. Uh, but I'm excited to do this because I believe in this book. Now I've read the whole book already, but now I'm going back through and I'm red inking it. Uh, just like an old Bible would be, if you ever picked up like your grandparents or great grandparents old Bibles, you know the family Bible's all written in and there's notes and everything. Well, that's what I'm doing with this book. Hi I didn't have a highlighter, I'd be using a highlighter, but um, it's all good, man. It's all good. Just like planting and making a garden, it doesn't have to be pretty, right? Uh, so let's get into it. All right, right here. What is companion planting? Well, it's really simple. It's planting any plant that helps another plant basically so by definition companion planting is the practice of growing different plants together to achieve mutual benefit or for one plant to benefit from another plant so again it's the use of using one plant to help another plant or for one plant to benefit from another plant so like dill dill is a great plant to plant with tomatoes because the smell of dill kind of masks the smell of tomatoes which certain pests hone in on that smell that tomato smell and if you've ever been out in the garden and you've got a bunch of tomatoes you know that smell that amazing tomato smell so you want to hide that from the moth that creates the hornworm and I had a huge hornworm last year it's hard to say that word isn't it? hornworm uh, caterpillar last year on my single seed challenge plant so, and I didn't have dill around it, but that's an example of plants helping plants. I have read that at certain times, people would grow corn stalks and then grow a trellising plant at the bottom of that corn stalk and use the corn stalk as the trellis. I didn't know the name of that method. It was called the three sisters method. And basically he explains it on page 13. So on page 13, Right up here at the top, how did companion planting start? He explains it. You've got three different plants, all needing each other, and that's what the beginning of companion planting was all about. The Native Americans figured it out, and they started growing. And that's called the three sisters method, which makes total sense. So there, right off the bat, on the first two pages of the book, we've already nailed it. What is companion planting, and how did it start with an amazing historical reference to the companion plant. Been going back forever. So if we go on with the chapter, we're gonna start talking about organic gardening. And that's what he starts really getting into in, in this in the first chapter of this book. I've found some of the stuff in here quite humorous, like have you ever read the back of some of the pesticides? It says wear rubber gloves, you know, don't inhale, don't get in your eyes, you know, I mean good lord, don't be within ten feet of it. All this craziness. He writes a little story in here about how <laughs> basically when he was growing up he'd see people they'd be in ba basically hazmat suits you know don't let the stuff touch your skin and all that but yet 
you're going to spray it on your fruit or on your vegetables and then you're going to eat the vegetables does that make any sense no so he starts talking about organic gardening using nature to help nature basically like with the example of the dill and the tomato use nature to mask the smell to confuse a bad pest so throughout the book here there are a lot of examples on everything now i'm not going to go through all the examples or we're going to be here for you know ever but i'm going to point out the parts that i want to focus on the most why do you want to garden organic well it's simple you want to help nature me in this garden i want to help nature i don't want to put a bunch of chemicals out here into my ground or into my raised beds or anything else i want to grow the way they're that the plants are supposed to grow so growing organically just makes sense to me and what's the most important thing is understanding why you want to garden organically and how you can actually do it without all the chemicals that's a really important concept no chemicals i try to do nothing here that is not organic and i started this from the very beginning which was last year so moving on the five principles of organic gardening which i'm going to put up right here and i'm going to go through them real fast here nourish the soil well you got to take care of your soil the soil is the foundation of the garden without a good healthy thriving soil i mean what, what are you really doing you know uh, create your own compost i started creating that last year also uh, i got a composting bin for christmas and i've been composting ever since it feels good to not put stuff down the disposal stick it in that compost bin spin it and roll now i don't have a big one but that thing works pretty good plant the right plants in the right locations again if you need plants that are partial shade you don't want to put them out where there's no shade or if you have full shade or if you have full sun plants you definitely don't want to put them over here where it only gets seven hours of sun a day or six hours of sun a day so you have to plant the right plants in the right location which right there number three uh, next one use non-chemical pest and disease control method use plants plant plants <laughs> next to other vegetables that benefit each other. So again, the example of the dill, great example. Um, onions, I have planted a lot of onions in between the rows of my tomatoes. Now, not sure if that's really the smartest thing to do, but I know pests don't like the smell of onions and garlic, so I have onions and garlic mixed all over the place out here. Now I did that before I read this, and uh, hopefully I didn't screw anything up in that, but hey, it's gardening and <laughs> this is down home backyard gardening. So if I mess something up, you're gonna see it. I am not afraid to show my failures. <laughs> Just go back and watch my videos. <laughs> the fifth one, treat the garden as a single living organism. Everything goes together from the soil to the seed, to the water, to the fertilizer, to the air to the sun everything it all goes together and that's what he's talking about here treat everything as one and take care of everything you can't skip you can't skip around you got to make sure you're hitting stuff in the right <laughs> every time I start filming every time as soon as I'm quiet Whatever that noise is will go away. Every single time. Drives me up the wall. Okay, now to finish out chapter one, again, I'm not hitting everything in, in the book. I'm hitting the big things that I find or that I have found super educational to the point of, oh man, I've been doing this. So I'm not hitting everything, but I'm gonna finish chapter one on this topic right here. Hit on is interplanting flowers, herbs, and perennials. Again, I've been doing that. I'm going to show some examples here of different flowers that I have around the garden specifically for making my backyard not just a garden. I want this little tiny backyard that I have here to be my outdoor living. 
to be an outdoor living area. So I love flowers. I want vegetables in the backyard. So I decided to mix them all together. And again, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was already doing it. So pretty cool. The last thing I'm gonna hit on, grow a broad variety of flowers to attract a broad variety of pollinators. Hey, one thing I just did a video on two weeks ago for the second grade classroom. I did a video on pollinators. It's geared toward elementary school kiddos, uh, but I hit on different pollinators, the six different pollinators that, that we have, the six major pollinators that we have in the world. And bringing in the pollinators is what you need to do more than, well, I won't say more than anything, but it's very important to bring in pollinators because without the pollinators, nothing is pollinated or else we are all gonna be out there with little paintbrushes doing everything ourselves. So pollinating is super important, but having a diverse amount of flowers, herbs, uh, vegetables in the backyard to attract all the bumblebees, honeybees, and everything that comes to pollinate, uh, butterflies, uh, is beyond important. So chapter one ends on something that I find incredibly important. Again, mm -hmm. chapter one is done. Now we're gonna move on to chapter two of the book. Chapter two is a very long chapter and um, there's so much information in chapter two that I cannot cover all of it. So I will probably do a second video just for two points that he makes for chapter two in this that could I could easily explain for 10, 15 minutes by themselves. So um, chapter two is gonna be quick. Not quick, but I'm not hitting everything in chapter two. Okay, everybody, so I moved out here because this is one of my favorite parts of the yard. I'm gonna turn the camera around in, in a second just to show what I see out here when I sit in this specific spot. But it's important to me to sit here for chapter two because it's all about, chapter two is all about starting your garden. And as I'm sitting here, I'm sitting on a raised bed next to a container garden, containers, with my first garden in the background. So I picked, I picked this plus right behind me is a six-year-old vine that produces these beautiful yellow flowers twice a year. Two weeks ago, this whole thing was covered in honeybees, which goes back to what I just finished on from the last chapter, pollinators. Now, two years ago, I decided to start this backyard project. I did it for many reasons, but one of the reasons is it's something for me to do that I've always wanted to do. Now, for those of you who have never seen this channel before, this channel is all about a gardener's perspective from a beginner gardener. I don't know a lot. I, I just go with what sound, seems right to me and I roll with it. And I've had a lot of failures and I've had a lot of successes and I show them on this channel. But this garden right here that I'm sitting on was my first one. Um, I decided to make the corners a flower bed and the back fence line the actual vegetable garden where I would have my first garden. Then I've created, um, I've also put in cinder block raised beds, this raised bed I'm sitting on, some other raised beds, some other raised bed. So I've, I've turned this little tiny suburban backyard into a garden. Um, and it's about maxed out for what I can do here without just being a little too much. So he starts off with this talking about choosing a good location. Well, for me, I only have this location. Now I don't have any trees here, no trees over there. So I will always have good sunlight. So location for me is not a, a big deal, but it is if you've got trees and you need to map the sun and which we'll get to in a second. But this one, begin with the good soil. Okay, I am a big believer that if your soil is good, your garden is going to be good. Now I've done some videos over the past year about soils 
I make my own soil for my planters, for my container garden. I always put a mixture of my soil in the bottom of every hole of every plant or every seed that I sow. I put my own soil in there. It's a soil mixture. Now, I used to work at a, at a company that creates mulches and composts and soil blends. So I know a lot about that side of everything. I don't know a lot about the gardening side. So when I started to put in these beds, I was bringing material home to use as a foundation. And then over time, I have constantly amended these soils over and over. And I believe 100% that that's why I do have the success that I have because your soil is beyond important. I mean, imagine building your house and your foundation is like plywood. It's not good. It's not gonna do anything. You need a good solid foundation for your garden and your soil, to me, is where it really all begins, is, is the soil. Okay, and this one, big, big important. Create paths for access. My backyard, my back fence line bed here is just out of my arm's reach. I, I made it just probably six inches too big. So when I lean over to get vegetables, it kills my back because I have a bad lower back. So what I'll have to do is I'll have to stand across and stretch across and put my foot up on the fence and be all awkward in order to really do stuff over there, which again, I'm leaning over and I'm hurting my back. So I did not think that one through very well. All my other stuff I've thought through well. This bed that I'm sitting on is only three foot wide. So easily, I can easily reach across, not an issue. Both of my cinder block beds are only wide enough to where I can reach my hand, my arm over halfway across from both sides. So what he's talking about is uh, creating a path to, of access is you don't want to stand on your flower beds. Um, yeah. You don't want to stand in your gardens. You don't want to put your body weight into that, into those growing areas because you're compacting the ground. You're making it to where now the roots aren't going to go where they need to go. All the fungi and all the nutrients and all those little highways that are down in there, um, they can't do what they're supposed to do and you're compacting the ground. So creating a path, you want to be able to get around your garden without getting in your garden. That's what he's talking about. And that is a great point. In fact, I even put on there, great. <laughs> okay, moving on, determining when to plant. Okay, so for anyone watch, who's watched this channel, you know I've harped big time on expected, your last expected frost date and your first expected frost date. Uh, I'm in zone 9A here in the North Houston area. Uh, March 1st is the last expected frost date last year and this year. Knowing when to, determining when to plant is a huge, huge, huge uh, important step to know. And Mother Nature doesn't always uh, cooperate. Creating a sun map. Now, this is something I didn't even know about, but I ended up doing it not knowing it. When I decided to build a trellis system on this wall over here, what I did is I came out in the morning on a Saturday and I saw when the sun came up, when the sun first hit that wall. And then throughout the day, I was watching to see when the sun no longer hit the wall, where that wall went into shade. Um, turns out I have seven hours on that wall right now at the beginning of the spring time frame. So over the summer, it'll be a little bit longer and then in the winter, it'll be like almost non-existent. But what I wanted to do is know, hey, if I can plant beans here, well, then I'm going to plant beans here. Um, beans need a lot of sun, so they're not getting exactly the amount of sun that they probably really should have over there, but they're growing really good. Um, and one thing I do on this channel is I like to experiment. So, hey, if this doesn't work this year, then I'm going to move it. I'm going to shift. Um, and I'll show the failure if it fails. But... Creating the sun map is basically what I did there. You want to make sure you know where your sun is on your growing area. So again, going back to chapter one, or going back to the beginning of this chapter, um, finding your location of where you want to put your garden, 
Same thing with the sun map, is you want to know where, how much sun is hitting each area. And he explains in here, I mean, exactly how to create your own sun map. And I'm not about to try to explain that, because uh, he's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> I'm going to jump to the next one, starting a raised bed. Now, I know a lot about this one, because I have 14 of them in this backyard. So, <laughs> I know a lot about the raised beds, but um, I'm just gonna hit it real quick here. Benefits, less, less compaction. Totally true. As long as you don't walk on your raised bed soil or you don't put anything heavy on it, it's not gonna compact, even with plants in there. Think about it. The roots are going all through there, keeping the soil nice and, nice and loose. So, you're not gonna have compaction. You can actually have a longer growing season because if it's a raised bed, like some of these portable ones, well, you can move them around, right? You can move them. They're not stuck in the ground and it's safer. Now that's a big one for me because you can make raised beds as, as high as you want them. Now, most people do probably two to three foot raised beds. To me, for the amount of square footage that I've used for raised beds, that was way too much soil for me to be bringing back here. Most of my raised beds are 10 to 12, 24 inches or lower. Um, and the importance of that is if you have really bad health issues, the higher the bed is, the less leaning over you do. Now, I do have a bad back and it is what it is. I'm going to garden regardless until I can't walk. This will be something I do for the rest of my life. I made my beds to where I can at least reach across them. Um, now, I might need help getting up. <laughs> um, some drawbacks, the cost. Yeah, they're not cheap. Um, every bed I probably spent around 100, maybe a little less. But when I'm saying raised beds, I'm also talking these cinder block beds because they're raised, they're not in the ground. I didn't actually dig into the ground. All I did was make the raised bed and then I put the soil in and started amending and started having fun. He makes a good point right here that I highlighted. In my opinion, neither in-ground nor raised bed gardens should be walked on. Uh, yeah, you don't want to step on that soil and compact it. You want to keep your growing median as loose as possible. And <laughs> absolutely agree with that. The next part is container gardening. Now, Again, if you've been watching this channel, you know I have containers everywhere. I like to have a great mixture of different beds. I've got raised beds, cinder block beds, this wooden bed, container, containers, uh, those corrugated metal beds. The, the, I've got beds everywhere and they're all different, but I love the container garden. I love gardening in containers because you can move the containers around. If it gets too sunny, move them. If it gets too cold, move them. If it's too hot, move them. Um, over the winter, I, I lost a couple pepper plants, but that's because I forgot to water them. <laughs> um, is what it is. But for the most part, all my citrus trees I took inside, they're great. In fact, they're all flowering right now. A um, Bunch of my older pepper plants survived because I took them inside. So container gardening is awesome for that reason alone. Now, I'll get into the book here. Um, big, 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 big point here. You never want your roots, you never want the roots of your plants to get root bound inside the container. Now, funny thing is I just did a video on up potting and what up potting is and why it's important. And the, one of the biggest things about up potting is you're giving that plant's roots more space to grow. So you don't want to keep a big plant in a little tiny bucket. You want to give it room. And if you're not going to put it in the ground, then you're going to have to continuously up pot that plant. Yes, you do not want them to become root bound because all they're going to do is circle and circle and circle inside the container and that's not good. It's going to basically choke itself out. Also, you don't want to use garden soil in containers because it can compact. It says it right there. And watering and fertilizing. Hey, if you're going to do a raised bed, I'm sorry, if you're going to do a container garden, again, they are completely, those plants are completely dependent upon you 
to water them and to fertilize them. So uh, you gotta be on top of that. For me, every two weeks, I fertilize everything, everything. Okay, and then he says you should fertilize your containers weekly with a general liquid organic fertilizer. So like what he talks about on his videos, Neptune's Harvest, I use just a fish emulsion that I get from Ace or Walmart or um, wherever, but you want to use, he's saying weekly, so then I'm going to have to change it because I do everything every two weeks, but um, which is fine. Hey, that's why you get the book, right? Um, you get it to learn. He also, he also talks about um, plastic containers. Now, some plastic containers will leach their chemicals into the soil. Not to go into all the science, but you want to find containers that have that recycle logo that either has a two or a four. And um, that basically means that the container is safe. Now I use a lot of white containers that are food grade. It says it on their food grade containers. And from what I was told, those are perfect for container gardening. So I'm just gonna stick with that. I don't have a bunch of Home Depot or Lowe's buckets all over the place. I have those white ones. Moving on, he talks about cold season crops, warm season crops. I'll get more into that in chapter three. And then the rest of chapter two is about selecting seeds, starting your seeds, transplanting your seeds, and compost. Now, that topic alone, those few topics alone, could take me an hour to talk about because they are so important. And those I actually have a lot of experience on, not a lot, a year and a half. The composting I have nine years of experience on, so I, I know about composting. And I will do a video specifically on this part of chapter two on the next one. It's just too much to, I, I wanna spend time on those, on that topic right there. So jump into chapter three, companion garden plans. Let's do chapter three over there. Okay, chapter three, almost done everybody. Now chapter three is a super short chapter, but it's probably my favorite one because it, it breaks down exactly what companion plants to grow with what plants. So this chapter, I'm not gonna show all the pages, but this chapter makes it super, super simple. So it says right there, planting your garden, right? Now what I did this year that I didn't do last year is I actually sat down and tried to do this. I tried to figure out, hey, I wanna plant this with my peppers, this with my tomatoes, this with uh, the blueberries. Now I didn't have this book at the time. Kinda wish I did, but it's okay. We'll let you off the hook this time, Brian. All right, but chapter three, let me show you how awesome this is. All right, cool season root crops. We're talking, you know, carrots and garlic, beets, lettuce, onions, those kind of things. Well, what do you plant with those? I don't know. Well, chives. <laughs> Didn't know that. I also have marigolds everywhere, which I knew about marigolds because I grew some gorgeous marigolds last year, um, which I'm showing right here. And these marigolds were beyond beautiful. Now I knew they were beneficial, but I thought they were for the soil. I didn't know they were beneficial for bad pests. So um, I was excited when I read marigolds. I was like, yes. <laughs> Let's get to some of the important ones here that everyone thinks about. Now, of course, cucumbers, melons, radishes, squash. Again, dill. Who knew? Dill, 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 dill. <laughs> now this is something that I n I've never heard of doing using what they call a trap crop. Basically, it's just a crop that you plant for the bad pests to focus on, and they'll leave the good, the good vegetables alone. So he talks about in here planting blue Hubbard squash about five to 10 feet away from your cucumber squash, um, you know, your summer squash, your crook neck squash, the straight neck squash, the zucchinis. He talks about putting in this blue Hubbard squash five to 10 feet from that bed 
or where you have those vegetables. So the vine borers don't go after the good squash, they go after the bad squash. And I've never heard of that. So I will be doing that next year because it's too late now. I've already got, I already have a bed of squash over there and squash over here. So, But I have dill planted everywhere now. And then moving on to the one subject that everyone probably grows tomatoes eggplants and peppers now I have a lot of peppers planted here this year um, my last count I think was 15 different types of peppers I'm gonna be going pepper crazy and I have 12 different um, tomatoes growing and then on this page right here he talks about what we started this video talking about companion planting <laughs> and I'm gonna read this verbatim basil is my favorite companion for tomatoes, not only because together tomatoes and basil smell so good, but also because the strong scent of basil will confuse the hawk moth, which is the moth that lays the eggs for the, for the horn worm. Hard to say. <laughs> he also says here, I have had zero tomato horn worms on my plants since I started companion planting with basil. Okay, so basil is super important for tomatoes. I'm gonna use t a mixture of basil and dill along with the marigolds. And um, now, I have peppermint growing in that bed over there. I did not know you're not supposed to plant peppermint or spearmint, any kind of mint in your garden. I've done two videos on trying to get rid of peppermint. I'm not getting rid of peppermint. That stuff is everywhere. So luckily it's in the bed that I have a bunch of tomatoes in. So that's good because right there, spearmint. But he also says very, very he explains it right here. Always grow your mint in pots as it is very evasive. It's very evasive, y'all. If you've ever grown peppermint in a garden and then try to get rid of it, yeah, it, it just, it's a weed. It's a very flavorful weed, but it's a weed. And I have it actually in my lawn now. So, which you've seen the videos, it's all good. So, but that's chapter three. Now again, chapter three was super short, but it's super beyond helpful because it shows you crops, companions. It doesn't get much easier than that, y'all. And then now we're on to chapter four, which is soil creating the foundation. Okay, so as I finish this review, I, I want to say thank you to Brian for giving me the opportunity to do this. I've never done a review of any kind like this. I feel honestly some pressure in this, but I hope I brought out at least the points that are super important to me for what I've done, for what my experience level is. I really hope you all order the book off of Amazon or where, whatever you, uh, wherever you get your books. I mean, he says it in the title, right? Companion planting for beginners. This is written in such a way that you don't have to have any experience at all. And you can pick up this book and totally understand his points, his examples, his website is really good. Go check that out. And then if you haven't looked on Facebook for Next Level Gardening and joined that, his gardening community, you really should. Now, I'm not getting any kind of a kickback or anything for doing this video other than I wanted to do this because I believe in the book. Just like for Black Gumbo Southern Gardening's channel, if y'all follow my page, you know I really started this channel because of his single seed challenge. Um, because I believe in that challenge. I believe in the power of that one seed and what that one seed can do, not only for growing crops, but for planting that seed of growing, that joy of growing in a child. And once that seed is there, it's always gonna be there. It might go dormant, but more than likely it's a perennial. It's gonna come back. So um, just like I feel about that, about the single seed challenge, I feel strongly about this book. If you know someone who's talked about, man, maybe I should start a garden, buy this book for them. Let them read it. So, uh, hey everyone, if y'all are brand new to this channel, if you haven't seen this channel before, and hey, if you like 
my quirkiness, please hit the subscribe button. Hit the little bell so you're always notified whenever I post a new video. Check me out on Facebook and Instagram. And hey, as always, everyone, like I say at the end of all my videos, shine bright and harvest hard. And if nothing else, I really hope you all will go out and order this book. Or, I don't know how you go out and order a book. If <laughs> I really hope. He also, he also talks about um, plastic containers. Now, some plastic containers will leach their chemicals into the soil. So, not to go into all the science here. Really? Not to go into all the science. I don't have too much more. It's a mixture of... My soil mixture is a mix of compost, peat moss, and... Um, something else. Pure light. <laughs> dill, for example. Okay. Dill is a great plant to have around tomatoes. And as I'm talking, I've got a bumblebee coming over here to say hi. Now, this is something I had no clue about, never even heard of it, honestly, until I read this book. But I've been doing it the whole time, and I didn't know. But polycropping. In other words, you're not planting one bed of one crop. You're mixing crops together. Uh, there are so many benefits to that that it's just again read in here but real quick on polycropping if you do what's called mono what is it yeah monocropping in other words one um, one plant in one bed what you're doing is you're sending out the bat signal to bad pests for that one vegetable. So say tomatoes, if you put only tomatoes in one bed, well that smell is so strong that you're sending the bat signal out to all the pests that love tomatoes. So of course that makes no sense. Now on a giant monster farm, uh, that makes sense because they can afford to lose, you know, X percentage amount of their crop to pests. But if you're a backyard gardener, Hey, we care about every single tomato or bean or, you know, calamondin. You know, we care about everything. So you don't want to lose any percentage. So polycropping is you're mixing all the different crops together to help benefit each other. So for tomatoes, you're mixing other crops in that ward and scare off insects that focus on tomatoes. So right behind me, as an example, right over there, I have my single seed challenge plants for this year. One of the plants is Moonlight, the second grade classroom named that plant, and the other one, which is mine for down home backyard gardening, I named Starbright. Now I have them right over there, and right beside it is a giant dill plant that I'm letting go to flower. Within a foot of that dill plant, you can smell the dill. That thing is super strong. But right beside it, I also have basil growing, two different types of basil on each side of those two tomato plants. So I've got two, <clears throat> I've got two different plants surrounding the tomato plants to help ward off the smell of the tomato plant. Because I don't want this right here to happen this year like it did last year. And as what you're looking at is the biggest hornworm that I've ever seen. That thing was almost four inches long and it was on one of my tomato plants from last year so I don't want that this year so I am polycropping everything so yeah now hey full disclosure here I did get permission from him to do this review